Hey there, thanks for pressing play. I have an awesome conversation with former federal prosecutor Glenn Kirshner today about all the latest you need to know regarding the Trump indictments. Will there be future indictments, the schedule of it all, the Georgia RICO Act, Glenn Kirshner's relationship with Judge Chutkin. He argued against her in court as a former federal prosecutor, as well as her husband, too. Update on the classified documents case, talked about Giuliani, pre-trial detention, and why he thinks Trump should be in it. It's a great conversation, as always, with former federal prosecutor Glenn Kirshner, who's someone I can always count on to talk real quick. That's what this is. Can you talk real quick? A quick interview, although this one's 30 minutes. Usually it's about 20 minutes. And normally not a lot of production or plugs, though I do have a couple of plugs today. But normally on Can You Talk Real Real quick, different from the normal podcast because as we get right to the conversation, that's what you're paying for. I can't do it without your subscription, though. And soon I'll be on a new podcast platform, it looks like. There'll be ads. I'm not expected to generate a lot of income, but it will be promoting the podcast, so hopefully generating more subscriptions. So sign up now. Little as $5 a month, but some of you pay, many of you pay so much more than that. And that is what's keeping us afloat here at the Stand Up Shed So sign up now for a paid subscription and you won't have to hear any of those ads because every day the show is sent to you in your email. If you have any trouble getting that email, if you're a paid subscriber, let me know. Patreon doesn't have the best customer support. That is for damn sure. They're horrible, actually. But the service is one of the best out there to generate subscriptions for your work. And my work is the work, I think, of journalism, of activism, of connecting people to each other and building this amazing community, hosting the hangouts every thursday at eight hope to see you this thursday and of a special hangout on wednesday night to watch the republican debates i'm going to invite some people over probably some comedians to have some fun at the expense of these crazy candidates all of them this friday and saturday i'll be in washington dc so if anybody wants to hang out on friday night let me know i think we're going to pick a place and meet up email me stand up with pete at gmail.com a few of you have but i'll be in washington dc friday night and Saturday and Saturday night as well and probably head back on Sunday head back home but if you're in or around the area want to hang out Friday night especially probably the best time maybe some time to hang out Saturday I'm probably going to try to bank some interviews while I'm down there as well attending Glenn Kirshner's subscriber event with a whole bunch of really cool people including Allison Gill of Muller She Wrote Dean Obidala comedian Maz Jobrani and all those other legal commentators you love not to mention the Capitol Police. It's a kind of a star-studded fun event to be at. Really looking forward to doing that this Saturday in D.C., but I'm also looking forward to meeting you. If I haven't before, email me for D.C. Weekend Hangout. Stand up with Pete at gmail.com. And I'll be performing out in Iowa City again. Very excited to be back out at my friend Mark Nolte's place. He's got a new theater, and it's in Iowa City. I'll be out there September 7th at the James Theater in Iowa City. You can find links to that at my Twitter feed. It's the pin tweet or in today's show notes, although I keep forgetting to add it. Somebody just called me on it. I'll get to take a link in there. Sorry about that. All right, now let's get to my conversation with Glenn Kirshner. And of course, you should follow him on YouTube. He's got a podcast now. He's big on Twitter and you can always watch him on MSNBC. But always let him know that you heard him here on Stand Up. It never hurts. It always helps. And Glenn is one of the best. So let's do it right now. It's time for the Kirshner Report, as I call it, with Glenn Kirshner. Oh, there he is. Glenn Kirshner, the superstar, constantly working over the past few years trying to inform us in so many different outlets. So my first question is, sir, how how do you feel given the four indictments and, and the observations and analysis that you put into it for several years now that we are finally here where we're going to see some justice, it would seem? Yeah, I feel like we are moving in the direction of accountability for Donald Trump's crimes. It's a beautiful thing. It's a necessary thing. If we didn't prosecute Donald Trump for his crimes, that would be the Department of Justice giving the next aspiring dictator permission to do it all over again. So I am so pleased with the progress we've made, and I can't wait to see the Trump trials. Is there any evidence? Does anything make you think that there's going to be more investigations? These were the four kind of investigations, jurisdictions we thought there might be indictments on. And some people think, like our friend Alison Gill and maybe you, that he should have been indicted for his 
delinquency or irresponsibility while he was the president on COVID and other crimes. And the, the president, the former disgraced president himself, apparently says there's like seven investigations in total. I think I saw that on your Twitter feed. Any reason to think that there's going to be any other investigations, much less indictments, grand juries, et cetera? Yeah, let me answer both pieces of that. First of all, he will be indicted by probably the state of Arizona next. Here's the thing. Just as he violated the state laws of Georgia with respect to soliciting election fraud and committing any other number of crimes in violation of Georgia state laws in virtually every other battleground state, Pete, where he, you know, put this fake elector scheme into the mix. He violated state law, maybe with the exception of Pennsylvania, because they worked a little escape clause into their fake elector certificates. Doesn't mean Trump didn't violate state law in Pennsylvania, but the fake electors probably won't be uh, indicted for those crimes. So just as he was indicted for George in Georgia, he should be indicted in all of the other battleground states. Will every battleground state indict him? Probably not, but some will. So I think Arizona might be next. So, yes, you will see more Trump indictments coming. Hmm. And then to answer your other question, which is as important, what about all the crimes he committed while president? And I'm not just talking about the involuntary manslaughter that he has culpability for as a result of avoidable COVID deaths. But we're talking about bribery and extortion of President Zelensky. That's a crime that a novice prosecutor could prove in his or her sleep. It was it was so obvious that when you take congressional funds and you tell a world leader, I know these funds have been designated to go to you, President Zelensky, to guard against unlawful Russian aggression. But I need a favor, though. I need you to announce a bogus investigation (laughs) of my political opponent. Pete, what I've just described is bribery and extortion, hands down. What happens if those crimes go unprosecuted? What happens if the obstruction of justice crimes documented in volume two of the Mueller report, go unprosecuted. It's the Department of Justice giving the next, you know, wannabe dictator, the next corrupt president permission. It's stamp of of approval to do that all over again. I don't think that's something our country should have to put up with. Yeah. One of the most convincing arguments, not convincing to most people, but to a lot of people, unfortunately, Trump supported Republicans is that This is political. And Joe Biden is using his Department of Justice to prevent his likely opponent from being able to even run. Well, you just remind us. I mean, that's exactly what Donald Trump did when he tried to extort that information. He was trying to sully Biden, who had not actually announced that he was going to run for president again, but that he thought likely would be the candidate that he'd have to run against. So that's a good reminder. Uh, What about the timeline Glenn Kirshner, these four trials, these four cases, you got two with Department of Justice, that's Jack Smith. You got one in Manhattan with Alvin Bragg, and then you got uh, Georgia with Bonnie Willis. Do the the three of them get together and and, and hammer out a schedule on iCalendar? Do they use (laughs) iCalendar? Do they use Google? Boy, Donald Trump's criminal dance card could not be more full. (laughs) I hope that the prosecutors will at least um, uh, communicate with one another. I'm not saying they should, you know, uh, collude. I'm not, but they should communicate on the scheduling front, if only because they are going to have overlapping witnesses, right? A witness who will testify in the federal trial in DC may very well also need to testify in the Georgia RICO trial. So I think the prosecutors should be communicating with one another to try to come up with an order of trials that makes some sense. Which one do I think will go first? probably the federal prosecution in Washington, D.C. I think the whole nation has an interest in having that one resolved promptly. Right. So Donald Trump, in the horrific event, he's the nominee for the the Republican nominee for the presidency in 2024. At least he'll be tried, I assume, based on the evidence, he'll be convicted. And then at least the voters will know whether they're going to the polls and casting their vote for a convicted felon or for a fully exonerated you know, man who the jury said not guilty on all counts because he's done nothing wrong. That ain't going to happen. So I'm hopeful that the D.C. case will be the first one to make it to trial. Donald Trump, through his lawyers, asked for a start date on that case. Let me see. uh, For 2042. Yes. Yes. Why so soon? I mean, let's push (laughs) it off into the three thousands or that. Come on. 
You know, and the good <laughs> news is, Pete, that shows that Donald Trump's defense lawyers are not really interested in engaging in legitimate lawyering. They're mm. basically acting as assistant campaign chairman mm. for Donald Trump. And the judge sees it. And I think this will help accelerate the trial date, just as she promised she would do if Donald Trump engaged in witness tampering, which he did in Georgia in a post. Now, I was listening to your excellent podcast, which you post uh, every week, along with your daily YouTube videos. And uh, we found out that back in the old days, you actually went up against Judge Chutkin and you also went up against her husband. Uh, you know a lot about this woman. You were a prosecutor. She was a public defender. So apparently was her husband. And you take this personally. And what I mean, this is the threats against her. You go in detail and some of the threats. And I hadn't heard about that until reading your podca- uh, podcast, listening to it. So it broke some news to me. You actually read out the actual one of the threats against her. This woman has since been apparently arrested. But you take it personally. You're pissed. Tell us about what you know of this judge, her husband, her family or her character. Yeah, you know, D.C. criminal justice circles are actually pretty small, Pete. I always said D.C. is a big city, but a very small town. Everybody knows everybody in the criminal justice community based on one or two degrees of separation. I tried murder cases against Tanya Chutkin back when she was a public defender for the District of Columbia. I was an assistant United States attorney prosecuting murder cases. And I also uh, tried murder cases against her husband, who was a public defender who went on to become the head of the public defender service and then a D.C. Superior Court judge. He just retired in June. These, Pete, are some remarkable, lifelong public servants. And lest anybody think public defenders because, you know, well, no, they're the ones trying to get the bad guys off. Lest you think they're not public servants. They are every bit the public servant as a prosecutor or a police officer is. Why? Because one, they're enforcing the Constitution and they're giving the defendant zealous representation when the entire state or the entire United States, if it's a federal prosecution, has brought charges against somebody. How daunting is it, Pete, for somebody to be a defendant in a federal prosecution when the caption of the case is the United States of America versus Joe Smith? Doesn't sound like a fair fight. That's where public defenders come in and God bless them. But here's the second thing they have to do, Pete. And yes, I'm singing their praises because I don't think you hear this often enough. The other thing they do is they guard against prosecutorial overreach. They guard against police misconduct. They guard against the government trampling the constitutional rights of citizens. God bless them doing that double duty, representing the defendant zealously and keeping the government in check against abuse and overreach. So, yes, Tanya Chutkin and her husband. And in this day and age, it's terrible because I hesitate to spit out his name. Not that your folks are going to dox him, but it's like that's where we are now. Right. Look at what happened to the jurors, the grand jurors down in Georgia once their names were disclosed. Um, But these are lifelong public servants dedicated to the cause of justice on the other side of the bar, the defense bar. And I was on the prosecution side. I don't often say that I really enjoyed trying cases against a particular defense attorney. Some of them I don't care for, but she and her husband, they were a pleasure to try cases against because they were smart, they were strong, they were aggressive, but they were honorable and trustworthy. And now look at what Judge Chutkin is suffering at the hands of Donald Trump's supporters. I want to go back to stay with the federal government prosecution department of justice. We haven't heard as much about the classified documents case lately, except for if you're paying attention, I feel like we heard news that both the former chief of staff, Mark Meadows and the former vice president, Mike Pence, both say they have no knowledge of Trump ever officially declassifying those files that he shared (laughs) with everybody apparently that wanted to see them. Uh, We heard it on tape. Even I feel like that is some news. Anything else on the classified documents case or on that Kirshner? Other than Judge Aileen Cannon, Trump appointee slow walking the the case. And I still think Mm. that her impartiality can reasonably be questioned, which Mm. is the federal standard. The federal law says if a judge's impartiality can reasonably be questioned, he or she must remove themselves from the case. Of course, Judge Cannon hasn't. And she's slow walking this case. Hard to prove uh, that anybody anywhere is slow walking something. Yeah, these days. But um, 
Uh, but you're absolutely right. Pence and Meadows further undercut Donald Trump's claim that he declassified the documents that he unlawfully retained and refused to return when they were subpoenaed by the grand jury. And what this highlights, Pete, is that Donald Trump will be convicted at trial, multiple trials, with a chorus of Republican voices, Republican witnesses. Right. Donald Trump is done. The challenge is getting the dang cases underway so the prosecutors can present what is overwhelming evidence of Donald Trump's guilt. And I can tell you, but for maybe a stray juror who is not an honest broker of the facts and has an agenda that is the, that he or she keeps hidden from the judge and the prosecutor and the defense attorney ju during jury selection. I throw that caveat in there. Yeah. But for that, Donald Trump is going to be convicted hands down. Sticking now with Department of uh, DOG, J DOJ January 6th case. I feel like you made the different uh, differentiation between what happened in Georgia, where there's like 19 indictments. You'll see a lot of them flip. We can talk about that in a second. And what happened on the January 6th case, where it's just Donald Trump being indicted. This is, I believe, the strategy of the prosecutor, the special uh, prosecutor, Jack Smith. Why? Why did he just indict Trump when there's so many other people that uh, were part of the conspiracy that he's being prosecuted for in this case? Yeah. Kiss. Right. Keep it simple, stupid. I mean, Jack Smith's prosecution is built for speed and alacrity to the extent anything in the federal court system can move with alacrity. He wanted to bring this case and get it to trial promptly. He wanted to call out all of the co possible co defendants, the co conspirators. I mean, look, there are six un uh, unidentified co conspirators in that indictment. Right. Yeah. What we know is that Jack Smith's investigation concluded that there was enough evidence to put these people in the indictment as co-conspirators, but he opted not to indict them in that indictment. Rather, he's going to indict them separately in a future indictment because he's focused like a laser beam on Donald Trump, because Donald Trump is the leader of this criminal endeavor to overturn the election's results. So he's going to get the promptest trial date he can get. Whereas compare that to Fawny Willis's prosecution, yeah. Jack Smith's is built for speed. Hers is built as a comprehensive vehicle to hold everyone accountable who violated Georgia state law. 19 defendants, 30 unindicted co-conspirators. Fawny Willis don't play, but her trial is going to take some time. What does it mean to be an unindicted co-conspirator? Does that just mean that you're, comp you, you're, you're cooperating, so we're not going to arrest you? No, not necessarily. It can mean, I would say, one of three things. Either you're part of the conspiracy, but the prosecutors gave you immunity because it was more important to extract from you the incriminating evidence you have about the crimes of others than it is to prosecute you. That's one kind of unindicted co-conspirator. A second is, as you mentioned, you were part of the conspiracy, but you pleaded guilty to your crimes and agreed to cooperate. So now you're an unindicted co-conspirator because you're cooperating. And then the third is what I think we have here. You are a co-conspirator, but we're not going to indict you in this indictment because we want to go to trial against a more important person first. We will indict you, Mr. Unindicted Co-Conspirator, in a future indictment. Those are kind of the three different possibilities when it comes to an unindicted co-conspirator. I try not to use the word hate. I really dislike Rudy Giuliani, I always have, uh, before 9-11, on 9-11, when I w lived in New York, I never really understood the respect that he was given. I thought he fucked all of that up. I, I, I don't get it. I think he just played for the cameras well. Uh, tell me something about Rudy Giuliani's future. Oh, he's done. He is done. And here's why. Here's why most, most directly, right? He's charged with RICO conspiracy down in Georgia. Yeah. He's not yet charged in D.C., but he will be in the future. In his criminal endeavors in Georgia. What do we now know he did? He lied to the state legislators down in Georgia about Shea Moss and Ruby Freeman, two Georgia state election workers. He, he testified that they were stuffing the ballot boxes for Joe Biden. He called them drug dealers. I mean, if that's not out and out racism, I don't know what is. And here is what's most important. He has now admitted in a court filing in the defamation case brought against him by Shea Moss and Ruby Freeman, he admitted that he lied. 
he admitted that he defamed those two women. That admission is an admission to his guilt in the prosecution in Georgia. That's how powerful that admission is that he lied to state legislators about election fraud in Georgia. Pete, he is dead and stinking oh. in the Georgia prosecution. I love it. I love to hear that. And let's stay with the Georgia prosecution. You wrote a piece for MSNBC.com, an opinion piece titled Trump seems to have already broken the most important condition of his release. If our system of justice is to retain any legitimacy, Trump's latest truth social transgression simply cannot go unaddressed. And you're talking about when he put out a post, a press release, if you will, that he said, I'm reading reports that failed former Lieutenant Governor Jeff Duncan will be testifying before the Fulton County Grand Jury. He shouldn't. Uh, this is what your piece is about. You do not think that he should be able to stay a free man. This is a pretty controversial take, or is it? No, this is follow the bouncing consequences here, Pete. This, <laughs> this is this is criminal law 101. I was in court when the magistrate judge in D.C., told Donald Trump, and I quote, sir, the most important condition of your pretrial release in this case is that you not commit any federal, state, or local crime. If you do, you can be revoked on release and jailed pending trial. Do you understand, defendant Trump? And Trump mumbled yes. Um, He then posted something days later, and he said, I know this person Former Lieutenant Governor Jeff Duncan is about to testify before the grand jury, frankly, in a case investigating my potential Georgia state crimes. He shouldn't testify. He should not testify. He told Jeff Duncan, don't testify. There's a Georgia state law, for Christ's sakes, Pete, that says if you attempt to influence a witness in their testimony before the grand jury to delay it, to alter it or to say the person shouldn't testify, you've committed a Georgia state crime. And he did it while on release after he was told his most important condition of release was to not commit, among other things, a state crime. This is revocation by the numbers. So on the 28th of August, I'll be in court again when this case is called before Judge Chutkin. I hope to heck she takes this up because if she doesn't, it's like telling your child not to do something and then once your child does it, imposing no consequences. What, what's going to happen? Your child's going to keep doing it. Donald Trump, the child, the very dangerous child, is going to keep doing it if the rule of law doesn't assert itself and if he's not held accountable for intimidating that witness in Georgia. I mean, he is there a parallel that you can draw from your career? I've been I'm always watching mafia movies and organized crime and all that. And the idea of threatening a witness like he said, it's he said he shouldn't testify like he said he shouldn't talk to them like it's I guess I don't know. Does he understand where that line is? Like, is it more of a threat if he says it, you know, it'd be shame, a shame if something happened to Jeff Duncan, if he testified. I mean, how is he it? He was more direct. He was more direct, isn't it? Wouldn't it be a shame if something prevented Jeff Duncan from testifying? Pete, he went further because there is no line for Donald Trump because he's crossed every conceivable line and he's never, never been held accountable for it. It's worse. It's more express. It's more overt when you say he shouldn't testify against me. That's why he needs to be held accountable. Now, this is a a decision that the judge has the ability to make, whether to have any kind of pretrial detention. And do you think it's fair to say that if this were any other person, that they would be thrown in prison for these types of threats? In, In a New York minute, in a New York minute, anybody but Donald Trump would already be detained pending trial. Pete, he's got four major felony cases against him, right? One in New York for falsifying business records to steal the 2016 election, very deeply damaging information about playmates and porn stars. This is not just any old falsification of business records case. He's got the case in D.C. for trying to overturn a presidential election. He's got a RICO case against him for being the head of a RICO conspiracy in Georgia, you know, and then he was 
found to be in possession unlawfully of classified information. He obstructed a grand jury investigation and he violated our nation's espionage laws. And he's not in pretrial detention. So would that be the judge or the prosecutor's discretion to request? You got to put this guy away and take his phone from him. Uh, The prosecutor's um, responsibility in the first instance to make the request. We haven't seen that request made yet. That's a shortcoming of prosecution. And I'm not, you know, I don't take any, you know, pleasure in criticizing my fellow prosecutors. That's a shortcoming. Ultimately, it's the judge's responsibility. And now that Donald Trump has violated terms of judicial release, I hope the judge sits up and does something about it. Glenn, we could both uh, pontificate about the political impacts of all these legal all these indictments uh, of Trump. But there's one specific legal issue that has been brought up that was, you know, you, you've talked about this at length. A lot of people are debating this by two conservative legal experts. They wrote a whole piece about it. I believe that Trump is not actually eligible to run again for president or any office because of the insurrection. And they cite the 14th Amendment, Section 3. My friend Eric Siegel, Professor Eric Siegel, doesn't agree, doesn't think that it's provable. How how would you actually do this anyway? Uh, you you disagree. You think that he's not eligible but for, for the crimes he committed against the country. Is that right? Yeah. One of the, you know, most um, celebrated conservative constitutional scholars, Judge Ludwig on the right, and one of the most celebrated you know, liberal constitutional scholars, Professor Lawrence Tribe on the left, have jointly studied this and concluded that um, he should not be permitted to have his name placed on the presidential ballot. And basically, Pete, it is a disqualification question that is controlled by the Constitution, just as if you were 34 years old, right? You're ineligible. And a secretary of state would be violating the Constitution by putting your name on the ballot if you weren't a natural born citizen or if you engaged in an insurrection or gave aid and comfort there too. all of which Donald Trump did. I understand the question is, but what's the vehicle to make that decision? Here's the vehicle. And I didn't come up with this. These are the constitutional scholars who said this is how it works. A secretary of state in a blue state, let's face it, will say, I am constitutionally prohibited from putting Trump's name on the ballot. And I take that very seriously because we all saw him engage in insurrection, incite, assist and uh, um, and give aid and comfort there, too. He's doing it to this day by saying, I will pardon the people convicted of those crimes. Right. Yeah. So once the secretary of state in a blue state says, I cannot do something that's unconstitutional. I won't put his name on the ballot. A suit will be filed and and it will be litigated in court. And the judge will make the decision by a preponderance of the evidence. I believe either Trump did or didn't engage in insurrection in the red states. Secretary of of state will say, I don't believe Donald Trump was uh, engaged in an insurrection. I'm putting his name on a ballot. A suit will be brought there and a judge And you're going to have all of these suits brought and you're going to have judges decide whether Donald Trump did or did not engage in an insurrection. And I'll tell you, plenty of judges, when they study the facts and the law, will conclude Donald Trump sure as hell did. And he's still giving it aid and comfort. Therefore, the Constitution disqualifies him. Well, you say the same of many serving congressmen, too, right? They were part of... uh supporting the insurrection as well. They shouldn't be they shouldn't be eligible either. Same rule. Six of them. Some of them have since left Congress asked for presidential pardons because they knew they committed crimes (laughs) on and around January 6th and they wanted to get away with them. Of course, some of them are criminally responsible for participating in the insurrection. Hey, you were in court and paid a lot of attention to a lot of the insurrectionists themselves, these Proud Boys and uh, Oath Keepers, et cetera. Uh, I think there's a sentencing phase being carried out in one of the uh, one of them. But what do you what else uh, have you been paying attention? They're still arresting these people. They're still identifying them. I I think just recently there was another one uh, arrested and identified. What's the, the latest on the insurrectionists themselves, those who 
attacked the Capitol. So the latest is, yeah, the FBI and the Department of Justice will continue to arrest insurrectionists for years to come. Literally, they're not going to let this go. If they have the evidence to charge somebody, if they identify them somehow, some way in the future, they will arrest them. And that is as it should be. So the latest is the sentencing of the Proud Boys and the prosecutors asked for sentences of between 20 years and 33 years. Enrique Tario, the chairman of the Proud Boys, former chairman, they asked for 33 years in prison. That is somewhat more than they asked for Elmer Stuart Rhodes, the leader of the Oath (laughs) Keepers. Don't call him Stuart. His name is Elmer and he hates it. Elmer Stuart Rhodes, the prosecutors asked for 25 years. The judge imposed, I believe, 18 years. So, you know, people can complain the sentences should be higher. The sentences should be lower. I think the judges are doing the best they can to take everything into account and sentence people accordingly. But I was glad to see uh, some of the just straightforward condemnation in the government sentencing memorandum of what Enrique Tario and the Proud Boys tried to do. They, They just tried to kill our democracy And the prosecutors are going after them with big numbers in sentencing. All right. My last question has nothing to do with the legal, but I've asked you uh, often for parenting advice. Just drop my oldest daughter off at college. You have five daughters all grown up and out one son. Uh, What is your advice for me? How do I go on with this empty bedroom, this this seat that is no longer there at dinner? Do I just sit there and think about how much fun she's having? How do I possibly you've you've been through this many times. Yeah, there, there's no way to cushion the blow. <laughs> you know, when I took my first daughter to college, first of all, I felt like my my posse, my basketball team, I had five daughters, was, yeah. was being broken up, and I didn't like it. Um, and I took her to college in Chicago, and, and I'm not making this up, Pete. For the first six hours of a 12-hour car ride home, I cried. I cried oh, for good. six that hours. That makes me feel better. The good news is each time I took the next daughter off to college for freshman year, I cried a little less um, but correlating, even correlating my, with your love for each one of them. Is that right? Even delivering my son <laughs> to, to his first year, which was oh, a few did. years ago now, I, I shed some tears. I mean, so it, it gets easier over time, yeah. like any loss. And it's a loss. If you like your it, kids, I listen, <laughs> I didn't play golf on the weekends I, because right. I wanted to hang with my kids Same. because selfishly, that's what I had fun doing, yeah. watching them play soccer or yeah. go to swim meets or, you know, whatever. And so, oh, it was devastating, devastating. And I, you know, I still miss them. But you know what? Most of them are in the area. We got the grandkids now. So it's all good. It'll all work out. You're going to get through this, Pete. I appreciate that advice as always, my friend. I appreciate your time as always. And I look forward to seeing you this weekend. Thank you so much. All right, Pete. All right, there he goes, Glenn Kirshner. Go right now and let him know that you heard him here on Stand Up and that you appreciate whenever he joins me and subscribe to his YouTube channel, his Patreon, and his podcast and everything that Glenn is doing. Always great to have him on the show and obviously great to have you listening to it. I'm going to go get ready for the next one, which is a conversation with Michael Cohen. That should be coming up and posted shortly after this one. You can listen to it. So first we talk about the legal stuff. And next, with Michael Cohen, the political stuff. Who do you want me to talk to this week or anytime? Stand up with Pete at gmail.com. This has been another episode of Can You Talk Real Quick? And I know you appreciate it, so thank you for listening. Take a moment, take a breath, and choose to find some joy, no matter where you're at. I actually said that to myself as I walked into the grocery store the other day. I was like, you know what? I don't want to be here. And I said, you know what? I'm going to have a good time in here. I'm choosing joy. And I smiled, and I went and had a really good time. Weird, but it worked. Give it a shot. Stand up, stand up. Show your face of every color, yellow, black, red, and brown. She's the face.
Change was gonna come before the change could begin. They had to stand up. All right, they had to stand up. We got to stand up. We got to look the devil square in the eye. We gotta let him know it's his time to go to make it clear when all we hear is a lie. See him flee the scene of that experiment If you stand up stand All right, up. we got to speak up We got to reach up And raise your voice in every way you know how Don't be toes up, you got to show up Ain't no better time to do it but now No need to pledge allegiance to no wanton tribe Rise up, show up to the voice inside and listen well and it'll tell you not to run and hide it says stand up 